Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. Moving around New York is a challenge at the best of times. And if you believe transportation planners and other civic commenters, today's challenges are a mere precursor to future crises that could literally grind the city and region to a halt. The millions of people who live in or commute into the city each day ride on trains and drive on roads and bridges that are aging and fraying. There was general agreement on the need for billions of dollars in, in, in infrastructure investment just to maintain what we have, let alone, improve, uh, uh, let alone improve a region growing economically and a population. But of course, there was far less agreement on how we get there and how we pay for it. That political gridlock must be broken to reach a livable future. One of our guests today, former City Transportation Commissioner Sam Schwartz, better known as Gridlock Sam, has been a leading advocate of a plan called Move New York that would put tolls on currently free East River bridges, lower tolls on other bridges run by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, resurrect the, the congestion pricing plan imposing fees on cars that enter Manhattan below 96th Street, and use the revenues generated for major investment in both mass transit and street-level infrastructure. It is a plan that has something to appeal to and upset everybody. Meanwhile, the MTA's $30 billion capital plan is tens of billion dollars short of what is needed. And, MTA, and with MTA Chairman Tom Prendergast playing the role of Governor Cuomo's attack dog, the MTA is threatening to cut back city-based transit investments, including completion of the Second Avenue subway, if Mayor de Blasio doesn't pony up billions more each year. De Blasio notes that his latest budget uh, vastly increased what the city had originally been asked for towards the MTA capital plan, and once guarantees that the MTA and the state won't simply siphon off money for other needs. Even the city's taxicab industry is in a state of flux as the aggressive entry of ride-sharing app Uber has upended a 70-year-old economic model and driven the value of a taxi medallion down dramatically, just one example of how technological advances are changing our times. This is also a regional problem, especially for hundreds of thousands of New Jersey commuters as plans move ahead to replace century-old tunnels shared by Amtrak and New Jersey Transit. If one of those Trans-Hudson tunnels is, uh, goes down in, in the meantime, think Hurricane Sandy on steroids. The, roast will be, the, the result will be chaos on streets, bridges, ferries, and what have you. Another of our guests, Nicole Jelinas, uh, uh, has pungent advice for would-be New Jersey commuters committed to suburban living. Move to Long Island. It said that sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is just an oncoming train. It could be that the only saving grace is that those trains might have a hard time finding a track on which to hit us. We are joined by four New Yorkers involved in thinking about and planning for the future of a city and region that is already bursting at the seams. Nicole Gelinas is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute and contributing editor at the City Journal. Robert Sinclair is the media relations man uh, manager in the transportation planner at AAA, the Automobile Association of America. Gridlock Sam Schwartz is the founder of Sam Schwartz Consulting and a primary advocate of the Move NY plan. And Nicholas Bloom is a professor at the New York Institute of Technology and Urban Affairs. Sam, uh, let me start with you on Move NY. It's captured the attention of city, of city decision makers. Why is the time right? The past proposals have died on the vine. Yeah, I, and I've been involved with just about all those past proposals going down back to John Lindsay days in the 1970s when we actually got further along than Mike Bloomberg did. We got approval from the city, the state, the feds, and only an act of Congress could have stopped it, which is what happened. The Holtzman-Moynihan Amendment stopped it. Fast forward uh, to Ed Koch, and I was commissioner under Ed Koch. We tried it again. Uh, it didn't when work. When you say try it again. What? A, a form of, of congestion pricing. Mm -hmm. I was sued by my club, the Automobile Club. I'm a 50-year member. Robert is here to oh, you represent have a that. too. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I was sued by the AA, the Garage Board of Trade, and we, the city lost the lawsuit saying that the state had the authority. Uh, we move into 2007, 2008. Mike Bloomberg tries it. So I've got a lot of history there. So what I did in the past five years, spend time with the people that opposed it and uh, time with the AAA, and the AAA is working shoulder to shoulder with us. The New York Trucking Association recognizes that we need to change the way things are. So the plan differs dramatically from any other plan. It lowers the tolls on every single TBTA bridge, and we're talking about $5 off 
the Throgs Neck Bridge, the Whitestone Bridge, the Verrazano Bridge. It doesn't take all the money and put it into transit. A quarter goes for roads and bridges. And our roads and bridges, they just got, came out with a report card yesterday, the American Society of Civil Engineers. We got a D minus. And we're, we're just lucky. I mean, that's not quite a passing grade. I think we had one or two roads that put us over the F mark, but that's about it. Um, a correction on the introduction, yes. uh, the tolls, we would restore the tolls, which you remember, Bob, when you were at Brooklyn College, when Mayor Gaynor removed the tolls in 1911. Yeah. Of course, you're only a freshman and I was... <laughs> well, uh, what I also remember is the original proposal to toll the East River bridges. This is before Easy Pass, when you literally had to have a toll booth. And Howard Golden was the president of the borough of Brooklyn, said, if you, if you put the toll booths in Manhattan, maybe I'll consider it. Let them have the mess. Right, and, and now with, with electronic tolls, and you'll even have apps. It's obviously different. Yeah, th th there's no mess. You won't even see any toll booths. But I don't go as far as 96th Street down to 60th Street. I'm and, sorry, yes. And, I'm sorry. and even the upper roadway of the Queensboro Bridge would be tolled at a lower rate because it doesn't go into the central business district. And in addition, a lot of people, when I went around to the different uh, opponents, said Manhattanites were getting all the benefit and getting off scot-free. And Manhattanites, when the way they contribute to congestion is in taxi cabs, riding Uber and black cars. So south of 96th Street, we have an extra charge for those services that would be provided okay. uh, that would add congestion. Robert, um, AAA was in the forefront of opposition to, in particular, congestion pricing mm -hmm. and tolling proposals on the East River Bridge in the past. And yet you've... You've been much more open to this latest move and why. Why? What's, what's, what's changed? Well, there are a lot of good aspects of the plan. Uh, certainly uh, lowering tolls on uh, intra-city bridges and tunnels is a good aspect. And uh, taking that money and using at least some of it for roads and bridges we think is a good thing. Uh, the problem is if there's any problem with the, pro with the plan is that it might not raise enough money um, we've, we talked, I think it's $1.2 billion it's talked right. about that it would raise a uh, similar amount of money I think was raised when a, a payroll tax was imposed a few years ago. And it's not enough. You know, we need lots more money. Um, so going forward, uh, yeah, we think also the other part of the problem is the fact that Sam wouldn't be in charge of taking the money and using it for what it should be used for. Um, and that is an ongoing problem where mo money is taken from motorists and used on non-motorists related topics. Uh, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, also known as MTA Bridges and Tunnels, comes to mind. $1.2 billion collected a year, and probably half the money, 50%, goes to mass transit. Look, mass transit is important. We believe in a multimodal approach. But, you know, you can't keep picking motorists' pockets to pay for things that aren't motorist related. We've got roads. Probably half our roads are in very poor condition. Half the bridges, according to that report from the American Society of Civil Engineers, yesterday uh, are more than 70 years old. Uh, so we're in very, very bad shape. Uh, there's, there is a surcharge on licenses and registrations in, D in the MTA service area. Still, they don't have enough money. There's a petroleum business tax, 18.6 cents on every gallon of gasoline sold in New York, goes to the MTA, I think 85% of it. And yet, you know, Syracuse, Buffalo, you know, Schenectady, those states upstate, these people are paying for the MTA, and they're nowhere near it. So they can't, can't take advantage of something <coughs> that they're paying for. There is a, a $5 charge on every insurance policy for the Motor Vehicle Theft and Insurance Fraud Prevention Fund, uh, also known now as the Motor Vehicle Law Enforcement Fund. And because there are no 12-month policies, it winds up being $10 out of every insurance policy in New York State on the 17 million registered vehicles. No one can tell us where the money is going. It's supposed to be going to fight theft and fraud. Where it goes, we don't know. The dedicated highway and bridge trust fund is broke. 70% of 70 cents of every dollar collected goes to pay debt service on bonds. It's not a pay-as-you-go system anymore. So, you know, money is constantly taken from motorists. And where it's going, we're not sure. We've got decrepit roads and bridges. We need to do something and soon. Nicholas, was, you, that, was that an endorsement? I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, what you, what you would do here is a, is a skepticism about the, the way that promises get translated into reality. And uh, one of the largest infrastructure proposals that the governor just came up with when he appeared with Vice, with, uh, Vice President Biden mm -hmm. at LaGuardia Airport was the plane, the train to the plane. And, right. you know, we used to say that 
the highway to heaven will be built before the train to the plane. But and you're very skeptical on the on the finances, on on the usage and whether that's the best use of what they say is four and a half billion dollars, the four and a half billion dollar project. But at the same time, a lot of that skepticism, um, we heard a lot of that skepticism before the air train to, to with JFK, which I think by most accounts is judged quite a success. Um, well, there are a number of differences uh, between the air train to JFK and the one that's proposed for LaGuardia. But just to back up a minute, the, the air train, we don't really know uh, what it would cost, uh, maybe between half a billion and a billion dollars, most likely. Um, and what I think a lot of people have questions about is there have been other proposals for these kinds of connections to LaGuardia. And I'm, I think I'll go on the record here saying I don't think many of them had the train going to City Field. Uh, the RPA did a study a few years ago, and they had a whole series of options. They know transportation, et cetera. And their best two options, one was to have an air train go to Woodside, uh, and the other one was to improve the bus rapid transit system so that that would work better for riders. And the reason was that um, why these came out as the best of the options they considered, because they didn't even consider a city field option, uh, was that that gets you to the main branch of the Long Island Railroad, which is the di one of the major differences between the air train for JFK and this one that's proposed for LaGuardia. The air train for JFK serves as a circulator, which was absolutely needed for JFK. I mean, you had these widely separated terminals from the terminal city model. So that was a problem. So that solved that problem. Uh, and then the air train goes uh, not only to a subway connection, to, but to the main branch of the Long Island Railroad. So uh, that really sort of opens up uh, the, uh, the, the island commuters to use that train, as well as the city. You get a lot more service, et cetera. Whereas LaGuard this connection that would go from LaGuardia to City Field, one thing, you end up with the 7, which is you know, uh, something of a problem there. The, uh, the terminal for um, the Long Island Railroad is distant also from the 7, so if you change your mind or something like that, it's a much bigger hike. And then that Port Washington branch is not as heavily trafficked. It's a very, it's a very nice ride. It, there's some good things about it. Uh, but it's not as heavily trafficked uh, as the Long Island branch, which is the main branch. So those are some of the questions. Even leaving on the table the amount of money unknown uh, which would be served. Uh, so that would be... Some Nicole, you've uh, um, taken a look at a lot of these proposals in your, in, in your career. And most recently, you have been looking at the uh, New Jersey proposals, at the proposals concerning the, uh, the move to replace the aging Amtrak and New Jersey Transit. And uh, why, did you, why did you tell people to move to Long Island, which I thought was a wonderful line? Well, the tunnel that takes Amtrak riders throughout the Northeast Corridor from Boston down to Washington. Which is the most and, heavily used route in the entire Amtrak system. And takes even more people, New Jersey commuters, on New Jersey Transit into Penn Station every day. The tunnel is 113 years old. It suffered significant damage during Sandy. And Amtrak, which owns it, needs to start to shut it down and do extensive repairs and replacement. We've seen a taste of that with some of the commuting disruptions that people have seen over the past few months. The problem is they can't shut it down because unlike in the East River, there's no redundancy. And so if you shut down one half of the tunnel, you lose half of your ridership you uh, lose service. more than half the ridership right. because of the... Right. right. And so this would create a commuting ca catastrophe. And so Amtrak is scrambling now to build a new tunnel before they need to shut this down, before it becomes an emergency situation. The, the, they may have... 10 years, they may have longer, they may have less time than that, but even if we start today, because of the difficulty finding uh, financing and so forth, it's going to be probably a good 10 years or longer until we have a new Hudson Tunnel. So it points up some of the problems with our infrastructure. One is how expensive these projects are. To open up one tunnel, it might cost five to seven billion dollars. To do the whole project and fix up Penn Station, it's closer to well above 20 billion, and the uh, higher estimate is, is unknown. And it, no one knows who is going to pay for it. 
uh, how are New Jersey and New York going to get their half of the funding for this project? Where is the federal government going to get their part of the project? Will they take it from other Amtrak projects or will they do a new appropriation? And even when financing is complete, how long is it going to take to do permitting and construction work and so forth? So it points up the challenges we have. This is clearly needed. There's no debate about it, unlike with the air, uh, air train to LaGuardia, unlike some of the other things we build. But yet, with the clear need and with everybody having a reason to get it done, whether it's Amtrak needing its corridor, New Jersey needing its people to get to work, and New York needing those people to come into the city, there hasn't been willpower to get it done. Sam, um, by the way, let me. Uh, this is non-commercial TV, but <laughs> Sam, Sam has a new book out called Street Smart, The Rise of Cities and the Fall of Cars that uh, I recommend to you. Um, transportation is, like, is kind of the capillaries, the uh, blood system of a city. It's how, you know, it's how everybody moves all, you know, you know on, of course, unlike the blood system, which goes like that. It, people are going every, every which way. And you plan for crises. I mean, that's one of the things that you've that you've done in your career. What about the crisis that she's that, that she's talking about? Yeah, I, that that actually dwarfs anything that I faced, and I faced some pretty bad ones. I was the engineer, and Bob, you remember, I closed the Williamsburg Bridge. Yes, I remember. I shut trains well. from the Manhattan Bridge because they were in danger of falling. I had two fatal accidents on my watch. Cables from the Brooklyn Bridge killed the Japanese tourists. Uh, the elevated portion of the FDR Drive collapsed, crushing a Brooklyn dentist below. It was the years that 10 people died on, on the New York State Thruway, the Schoharie River Creek Bridge, the Connecticut Turnpike with the Mianus Bridge. So what Nicole is presenting is, in, in many ways, in terms of service, I'm not talking about loss of life, in terms of service, service much more disruptive than anything else. It disrupts the whole Northeast. It disrupts business. Her quip about moving to Long Island, real estate values will go up as you move to the other side of the East River because you won't be able to get there from here. I mean, the Hudson River will be like, like a wall. And ferries can't handle the, and, the, and, and the, the, the ferries yeah. will, will handle it. There's like 400,000 commuters a day, I think. And, from, and, that and, and forth, they can handle from a few percentage points. But as Robert knows, it's, it's not just that that we're worried about. Uh, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway in Brooklyn Heights, the triple cantilevered section in 2007, I was one of the engineers from uh, working for the State Department of Transportation saying that that had about a useful life of about 10 years that we'd have to start repairing it. That was in 2007. Repairing by, it or replacing it? Starting to probably replace it, but we didn't have a plan then. We were worried. We started work. The state ran out of money. Uh, no, no work has been done since, and nobody has started to work on it. We lose that. We lose commerce through New York City. It's sad because today there's a young generation right in front of us, and we're telling them some pretty bad news that they're going to be very tough. Well, I think we're also ahead. challenging them to get, yes. to, to, you know, yes. get, to get down in the ditch, if you mm -hmm. will, and, you know, and, and work to fix these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you, uh, you guys don't usually talk about uh, things like the New Jersey transit tunnels, but, but you have been outspoken in, in support of it. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a vital part of our infrastructure, and we believe in a multimodal approach to transportation. We want east side access for the Long Island Railroad. We want the 2nd Avenue subway. Uh, where's the money? You know, uh, you know, I'll tell you how you can pay for these things. And something we've been advocating for a while now, raise the gasoline tax. The will is not in Washington to raise any taxes. We're talking about a nickel or a dime, even if it's 15 cents a gallon. Gas is cheap. It's, it's 238 a gallon. It's 228 a gallon now nationwide. It's 258 in New York City. Both those prices are more than a dollar a gallon cheaper than we were last year. You could add 15 cents nobody would even notice. And that would go to the, uh, the Federal Highway Trust Fund, which has a lockbox, unlike the one in New York State. And then we would have the money necessary to do uh, probably most, of, if not all, of the projects that we need to get done, at least in You're our area. You're talking about a national gasoline. National gasoline tax, right. Uh, which has New not York, been raised since, what, 1974 or something? 1992. 1992. I know it's a yeah, long time. Right, yeah, when Clinton was president. Uh, I think it's 18.4 cents per gallon now. You wouldn't notice a nickel, a dime, or 15 cents. But the will is not there. Um, 
and, and it's something easy that we could do. But where everything else that's being raised, and, and I neglected to mention in the opening, the Port Authority uh, and their uh, tolls, the fifth of which, the fifth of five increases that were approved in 2011, will kick in December 5th. And bad enough that it's going to cost a car $15 to go over the structure, it's going to cost a tractor-trailer truck $105 to cross that facility. And because we rely on trucks so much in our area, with probably 85 to 90% of all freight coming to the city by truck, that is a trickle-down that will hit everybody in our region. So, um, you're listening to this discussion about the relationship between cars and mass transit. You're an urban affairs professor. Um, is the will there to fix this? <laughs> um, I think that, no, at the federal level, that's, it doesn't appear to be that raising the gas tax doesn't seem like it's a, a likely scenario uh, politically. At the state level, I think it's very difficult as well. I think, um, you know, it, this is not an era of Nelson Rockefeller and, and government expansion, extra fees, um, and so forth. I think we have a fairly conservative uh, government in Albany as well. So I think that getting the, tapping that kind of money that New York City needs, it will be difficult. And I, I think part of the difference comes down to, I think in Albany, the, there is a, a strong sense that uh, New York City, right, tends to, even though there, you would raise extra funds, right, and those would go perhaps to New York State and the Department of Transportation and so forth, but those funds would, again, as you pointed out, would unevenly would benefit New York City more uh, than upstate uh, communities, which is not to say, the, to say that that's not important. The, the, the problem in New York is that New York City is the engine which is driving the state, but upstate voters and I think a lot of people don't quite realize how dependent the state has become on New York City as an economic engine and how the transportation infrastructure that is here, the maintenance of that is one of the key elements that defines New York as a global city. And that if we don't provide for the kind of finan the, for the financial industry, it's one reason I think Bloomberg was very good on a lot of this because he understood that when it came to urban infrastructure, we're competing. New York City is not really competing with with Buffalo and so forth. Right? We're competing with Tokyo, with London, and so forth, which are very innovative in transportation. They're offering, um, they're investing a great deal in urban infrastructure. They have state or provincial and national governments which invest very heavily. So trying to make that kind of argument is very difficult in New York to show New York State that New York City really needs this quality of infrastructure in order to compete globally. You made the point, um, I can't um, I was reading some of your work in, in, in preparation for the show. Um, you have this political gridlock going on, not only in Washington, but now in New York, you know, kind of symbolized but in this very strange fight that's, that's been going on between the governor and the mayor. Um, and you agree that that money that was that the city has put into the MTA has, in fact, in the past been diverted. Is that is that correct? Did I read you correctly on that? Well, what happens is that when the MTA is doing well, revenues that the state is supposed to send to the MTA every year, the governor will just take some of those away. And so one good example is the payroll tax, because the economy has been doing well. The MTA did not immediately. And that need payroll this tax was supposed to be dedicated to the MTA. And so the governor right. and the legislature lowered the tax for small businesses, for nonprofits, for uh, an erosion of the tax. And in the long term, the MTA should be saving that money up so that it could use it for the capital money that it needs a couple of years after the governor made that decision. So to simplify the issue, the governor has asked the mayor to put up another $3.2 billion to the MTA over five years, and that money would go to capital spending, replacing trains, replacing buses, repairing and replacing tracks, hopefully uh, some more stops on the 2nd Avenue subway and so forth. The mayor should dedicate this money to the MTA. The city has a record number of private sector jobs. It's got a record amount of tax revenue. It has surpluses. There are a lot worse ways to use these surpluses. However, the mayor is correct to say to wait and see where is the governor going to come up with his portion of the money of the MTA. The governor is also st supposed to put uh, eight, eight billion, yes, and 8 another 8 billion. 8 billion. And so is he going to 
you get that money from New York City residents, another tax on New York City, or uh, borrowing which city residents will have to pay sometime in the future. So perfectly fine for the MTA to ask for this money from the city, but also perfectly fine for the city to say, yes, but we're going to wait and see what the state is going to do first. Exactly. You raised that same question on the train to LaGuardia, is that uh, they're talking about all this money, but that nobody's allocated the money. That, you know, just as she's saying, uh, kind of reflecting some of the city arguments about the eight um, about the eight billion dollars, you know, the governor is demanding that the mayor put it up, but the governor hasn't said where that money is coming from. Right. I mean, that's the, you have a lot of interesting ideas which are floating around. There's a lot of there are actually commitments which have already been made. I would say that there needs to be some kind of prioritization of what needs to be done as opposed to what we would ideally do. I mean, the city is very deep in the MTA is very deep into the uh, East Side Access pro- East Side Access project project as well as the Second Avenue program. And those eat an enormous amount of this capital budget but and yet, so forth. But yet when it came time to extending the 7 train, the city funded that project. That was not MTA money. The city put up the money to right. uh, forget what I forget the tax increment. However, the, right. the, the, the it's, billions it's, of dollars. And uh, one argument is we have no business building new subways until we get the existing subways into a state of good repair. But on the other hand, if we waited for that to happen, we would never build anything. And so there are people out there who say it was irresponsible to start building the Second Avenue subway or to build the new number seven train extension. But these projects do encourage growth. They improve people's quality of life. People have lived on the Upper East Side for decades and decades and have been crowded on to these four, five, six trains. And Which they are the pay, most crowded in yes, the system. Yes, and they pay a tremendous amount in taxes. These are yeah. long-term New Yorkers who pay far more in taxes than when they get, get back. And so sometimes people say, well, this is not a good project because it doesn't encourage new apartments. The apartments are already there, but these people deserve a reasonably non-torturous commute, and so they will start to get that. So we do, we need money for expansion, so it was fine for Bloomberg to do this number seven train. Of course, we also need money for repair and replacement, but if you, it's the same thing with the Department of Transportation when people said to Bloomberg's Transportation Commissioner, you shouldn't be doing these bike lanes and so forth until we've got every pothole filled in. Well, if you waited for that to happen, you would never have any change in anything. And you've created a new business district on the far mm-hmm. west side, which was is attracting billions of dollars. And that's partly is really what is, if I understand the, the tax fund, the, the setup, is that's f- partly funding, right, this extension as well. So yes. it can be very creative. I think there are also opportunities to be creative about these kinds of investments. Yeah, I uh, want to follow up on, yes. on yeah, Nicholas's point and, and Robert's point uh, about funding. Uh, Nicholas talked about our competition as a world-class city, as a world city, and how we compete with London and Paris and other cities like that. And that's true. And we're losing our edge because they are investing so much more in infrastructure. But there's also an irony here in the United States. The two states that are doing the least innovative financing about transportation in New York and New Jersey Iowa has a a transportation plan. If you want to know where transit is being built right now, it's Los Angeles. And and the people of Los Angeles voted a a tax on themselves to provide transportation. Salt Lake City is doing great transit. Republican mayor uh, and is doing extraordinary things. It's embarrassing for me as a New Yorker to see New York not coming up with the kinds of funding plans uh, and uh, the, and uh, tra- the uh, transportation secretary said it was a crime that uh, New York and New Jersey have uh, not come up yeah. with a. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, we were talking. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say, I just worry that the motivation might have to be a, a, some tragedy, as we saw in uh, Minnesota in I-35, I think it was, yes. where the bridge collapsed. Many of our bridges are what they call fracture critical, where there's just if one load bearing piece fails. There's no redundancy in the structure. The whole thing comes down. Uh, but it wouldn't take anything major like that. I, I remember recently, in the last few years, uh, the Steinway Street overpass over the Grand Central Parkway collapsed and it closed that roadway down. And we have lots of little bridges, overpasses like that, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, what have you, throughout the city. If one of them goes and shuts down one of these major roadways, we'd have chaos. Right? So we need this, this, this overall plan to be done. 
for big grand structures like the Kosciuszko Bridge or Kosciuszko Bridge, as they called it in my I call it Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko, I, yeah. I, I, um, I grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah, the, the, you know, the Frog's <laughs> Neck Bridge. Thank goodness we're doing a new Tappan Zee Bridge because I've talked to reporters from uh, Westchester newspapers that took a boat tour into that thing, and they were scared to death at going underneath that. And they said if they ever drove over it again, it would be at high speed. So at least we're getting that done. But there's so much more that needs to be done. I just want to take a brief detour into this uh, uh, because I think Uber is so interesting. We talked about how, um, under, you know, under, under Ed Koch, tolling the East River bridges needed uh, toll booths, which are, you know, inherently going to cause great delays. But technology has changed that. Tech, you know, technology has made it maybe no less expensive out of your pocket, but you don't realize it because you're not dropping the coins in the, in the box. And Uber has changed an absolutely major piece of this city's economic infrastructure. You know, you know um, taxi medallions that were a million dollars two years ago are $600,000 today. And the people are going bankrupt and simply walking away, walking away from their medallions. I know you've written about Uber as well. I noticed that Rio de Janeiro just banned mm-hmm. um, Uber. And London is, uh, has come up with this plan, basically protecting the taxi industry. I'm a former cab driver, so I'm sensitive to protecting the cab industry. <laughs> They're saying you have to have a certain amount of time between the time you call an Uber and the right. time it can get to you, which seems like an odd thing that you must delay before you get there. I assume that's some attempt to even out some sense of them. But how is technology changing a lot of this? Well, there's a lot of reasons to like Uber, and there's a lot of reasons to dislike Uber. So whatever side you want to be on, you can take your pick. There, there are some arguments that are distractions to the issue that New York faces. Uh, people have brought up the uh, inequality issue. Uh, this is, it is important and good that if you live in a neighborhood where there are no taxis, you can call and get an Uber very quickly. But the issue that the mayor has been trying to address is a real issue and a technocratic issue, which is we can't have too much congestion in Manhattan, in the core business districts. It's bad for the economy, it's bad for commerce, it's bad for public safety, it's bad for air quality. What causes congestion? Lots of things cause congestion, but cars are a big part of what causes congestion. The more cars you have, the more congestion you have. And Uber cars are special kinds of cars because once they come into Manhattan, they will ride around for all of their time here, whether they're looking for a fare, they have a fare, or they're idling, double parked, waiting for a fare. All of these things cause congestion. And so clearly, having even just a few thousand extra cars doing this all day in Manhattan adds to our congestion issue. This is, in fact, why we got taxi medallions in the first place. The you look back, right. yeah, you yeah. look back 75 years ago, too many taxis chasing too few fares. A lo- again, just, just as today, a lot of things went into it, good or bad, but the taxi medallion was an early form of congestion pricing. You have to pay a big fee to have a right to drive a taxi continuously, pretty much, in Manhattan, unless you're going out to the airports. And so now that Uber cars are acting like taxis, what do we do to make sure that they don't cause the same taxi congestion problem that we once solved. That is an open issue, and there are many, many uh, ideas of what to do about it. But nobody can say, as some of the Uber supporters have said, that it's not an issue. The mayor is absolutely right to worry about this. And if he waited another year, he'd have more of a problem on his hands. Have you looked at, has, has AAA looked at the Uber question? It's, it's interesting you bring that up, because I think it was 2001 or 2002, I mentioned to a reporter that New York is under card in that if we had the same proportion of vehicle ownership in New York City that the rest of the United States has, there would be 4 million or 5 million registered vehicles in New York and not the 1.9 million. But now when Uber comes and people want them, you know, they're... I'm not being castigated anymore. It seems that, that people want these cars. Uh, part of the reason for the congestion, as we see it, has to do with a lack of enforcement of the basic rules. With yellow cabs, if somebody hails them, they stop. They don't pull over to the side as they probably are supposed to, and then you create little mini traffic jams, and you, there's lots of mathematical models. I was looking at a 
program the other night and they, it showed just, just one car. It was a transportation engineering student and one car driving slowly on a major highway slowed the whole roadway down for miles and miles. So people are, are uh, double parking, people are hailing cabs. Um, there was the idea some years ago about uh, making uh, deliveries overnight. So you wouldn't have, a, and we have an inordinate number of trucks in our region, but you could have the trucks come and make their deliveries overnight. Uh, should I mention the bike lanes that they've cut capacity and so that when one of these other things does happen where you maybe had four or five lanes before, now you have only two or three and so that it creates even more congestion. So there's, there's many things that cause con congestion and perhaps we could uh, do something as far as enforcement let me ask is you, concerned. Uh, let me ask you, this is kind of a little bit out of left field, but mm -hmm. the idea of, you know, we're talking about technology and the idea of driverless cars and mm -hmm. one, of the, uh, one of the ideas of driverless cars is that because they're going to be the cars are going to be talking to each other, right. you know. And in, in the cyber world, you can they can drive much more closely together. You don't mm -hmm. have, you know, the the kind of person. I mean, have you guys? I don't know if you all have looked at this at all. Well, we looked at it. Uh, in fact, there was an event. It's out fascinating in, to me. Yeah, there was an event out in Las Vegas where they had uh, autonomous trucks, uh, which make a lot of sense. You know, big truck out on the highway all by itself. Poor truck drivers, probably you know, bleary eyed popping amphetamines, driving too many hours. So it would make a lot of sense in that case. Uh, whether or not it would work in the city, you know, there's, again, there's more infrastructure that's required because it also would tie in in talking to pedestrians where your smartphone would relay to a, there's an interesting, interesting magazine called Thinking Highways. It, the signal would go to a pole, which would go to the car and let the person know that's driving the car, that this person is about to jaywalk in front of you and stop the car. You know, it's, it, it's highly complicated. Uh, we do a lot of driver training at AAA. Why don't we just train better drivers now well, instead I'm, of giving ourselves over to technology to drive us around? I'm at least, may or may not. What happens if it breaks? Well, I mean, I'm and, a, and who gets the ticket when it violates the rule? But yeah. but tying the two together. Yes. Uh, and Google already has. So Google has yes, invested I mean, Google in Uber, is, and so uh, they're going to well, create. And Uber claims that it's trying to protect the drivers of its Uber cars at the same time as trying to develop driverless cars, which right, is one right. of the so, arguments so I, I wouldn't that they have buy, a difficult buy, in, buy into that. So when Google invests in Uber, they're developing a car I call the Goober. <laughs> and the Goober is going to be riding all around and, and taking us uh, to different destinations. On highways, it makes a lot of sense. You'll be a lot safer. You won't have that slow driver that impacts every single person. You'll have drivers evenly spaced. But when it comes to areas like Manhattan, we don't need that. We have better things. I, I talk about the iPad, which is your shoes. We can walk a lot of destinations. I walked here from 26th and 8th, and we shouldn't give up on that. And uh, I was at an autonomous vehicle presentation, and they, the person was very proud talking about how, imagine your car will take you to uh, your office building. And I know in, in his mind it was an office park, not a building like we're in today. And uh, that the, you'll uh, exit your car and your car will park itself. And in my mind, I saw an Uber, uh, a Google, uh, an autonomous chair coming and taking <laughs> you to sit behind your desk. Sounds like the movie Wally. -E. And that exactly, yeah. that, that's what it is. Well, the other, I would say that the uh, we, this gets to the the point that a lot of this technology is being crafted in suburban locations. Mm -hmm. All right, where there's a very different model of transportation, and I think that and, there's and the demands are much yeah, are much, it's very much different. Less. Yes. And and I think that when you start applying a lot of this, what they call disruptive technology, uh, to these very entrenched systems, like you mentioned, the yellow cab system, and so. Uh, you actually, I, I think people are get a little overexcited about how it's going to transform everything overnight. I think by now we were all supposed to only be staying at Airbnbs, right? I mean, there are a whole series of these, um, you know, getting online degrees. Everything will be transformed. I think it's more likely that these kinds of things like the, the Uber system and the yellow caps are now going to be doing Uber of some sort, mm -hmm. that I think people underestimate the, um, the advantages that these entrenched monopolies essentially have. It also wreaks and havoc with a regulatory structure. I don't know that, that it wreaks havoc. I think they have to uh, that, that can be somewhat sclerotic, but also provides protections that you know when you get in a car, somebody has at least some degree of background. Well, that's it. And it's and like Airbnb. It has, the proper, has house. the proper insurance. Not everyone wants right. that, yeah. Ma'am? Ma'am, let me let me ask. Give us give us your name and, and your campus and ask a question. 
Um, my name is Rosie Pearl. I'm from Hunter College, and my question is: Do you do you think that Uber should be allowed to charge higher fares during more uh, demanding periods of use? Well, that's yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer that mm. uh, about surge pricing. Uh, the answer to that is. Uh, do unto Uber as Uber does unto others. And what I mean by that is allow for surge pricing, but let the government get the surge money during times of congestion. So apply that rule, which exists on a number of highways out west, where you pay more money to yeah. use a lane, a hot lane, yep. de depending on the congestion. So I believe in, in the capitalist system and apply that to Uber. And Uber is applying that to all of us. Sounds fair to me. Yeah, I, I agree with that, that this is one of the reasons some people dislike Uber. But if there are a lot of people looking for a car and it's not an emergency or anything like that, you know, a hurricane, it's only fair that you... Supply you, and demand. Right. And there is, there, is a, there is no need for most people to take a car on the spur of, of the moment. And so if you can't get one, if you don't want to pay the surge, you can find an alternate mode of transportation. And I think this is also where the, the goal of customer service sometimes is not the same as the goal of public policy. A lot of people say Uber is, is cheap, it's easy, the cars are nice, they're pleasant. It has made it a very simple thing to get in a car and ride around the city. But you don't really want it to be public policy for it to be too cheap, too easy, and too pleasant for everyone to ride in a car around the city. The part of the reason that we've got six million people using the subways every day and you've got, you know, maybe 600,000 using taxis and now 100,000 using Uber, is it is not that easy to ride in a car. You don't want it to be too easy because then we would have chaos on the streets. Unless and we had driverless real, cars. That yes, you have a real public policy problem. still have it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Shakti Robbins. I'm from Brooklyn College. And I'd like to know what the traditional taxi industry can do to compete with Uber and provide better services to New Yorkers in the outer boroughs. It's interesting that the taxis are, are, the, are the focus. <laughs> I mean, I think that the taxi system is trying, that you know, taxi cabs are trying to you know, embrace e-hailing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you, you, know, you have seen them adjusting. You know, we have a multi-layer layered taxi. system. You know, they're, still, they're still, you know, um, Ubers and livery cabs, or what we used to call gypsy cabs, will not be allowed to pick up hails on the street, even though they do in many, in many neighborhoods where you couldn't get a yellow cab, where, you know, the yellow cabs wouldn't go in there. So, I mean, the system is kind of adjusting. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's not adjusting enough. So there are, you will not find uh, an Uber easily in Brownsville, where I was born. Uh, you won't find. I would, it in, I would in actually a lot of, suspect actually. you might find it might be easier to get an Uber than, yeah. than it would than it would be. I think to get that, a well, then, someone did a study. I mean, a they, they found that this so there was a really heavy pickup. The percentage use or so forth of the Uber was was particularly high in neighborhoods which had lower income profile. They were had actually very popular. And no popular. yellow cabs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a, you know I am a taxi cab driving chauvinist. Yeah, that's so still that's still right. more than, uh, still about two thirds were in central yeah. business yeah. district in the wealthier neighborhoods. Yeah, but it was a proportion. And, and, uh, and the model uh, just isn't going to work that way. There are other services like Bridge, which is a, uh, a bus service on demand. And so you can build these transit services, but they will need some investment. I don't use the word subsidy because that seems to apply only to transit. We subsidize drivers, too. We subsidize a, a lot of people. But uh, I, know, I know Robert's not too keen on that. So, <laughs> don't subsidize uh, so I, I don't, much. <laughs> I, I don't use the word su subsidy there. But we should invest in some of these technologies that can offer transit service. VIA is here in Manhattan, and that offers uh, almost point-to-point -point and multiple passengers. You know, on a philosophical level, you know, your, your I don't want to say complaint, your point, there was a complaint, mm -hmm. about the fact that Cars pay all these fees, whether it's through tolls or, and it gets diverted into mass transit. Obviously, the absence of a mass transit system makes cars almost useless in this city. That's true. Um, you know, if we didn't have mass unless transit, we could use them, you know, put flower pots on them, we could live in them. <laughs> it would be far worse if we didn't have the mass transit system that we do. And lots of New Yorkers don't have a car; they don't drive; they have no license, mm -hmm. and that's possible because of the excellent mass transit system we have here. 
but you know, it's still necessary to have an excellent road system, if only for the, the trucks to make deliveries and for people to ride taxi cabs to get around. But there are also two million drivers in the city of New York. And for a lot of them, there is no mass transit alternative. Uh, I used to live in Southeast Queens. And, you know, if I was going to a media interview like this, you know, at three or four o'clock in the morning, I would have to go and stand on a bus stop mm-hmm. and wait for the bus, which probably ran only once an hour. And then take that to a subway, which ran probably only 15 minutes at those late hours. Point. One, so. of the, one of the littlest known points of Move NY, which I looked at because I worked with the Jamaica Development Corporation, the Greater Jamaica mm-hmm. Development Corporation, was to take existing, the, in the case of Southeast Queens, is an existing unused track to the Rockaways, I believe. Right, yes. And right. that you could... Resurrect some of those stations and come up with a yeah. system to charge them. The equivalent, you know, it's a technically a Long Island Railroad track, but you can set a fee structure that matches that of a. So, I mean, there's actually unused existing infrastructure. Right. And, and to, to Robert's point, we also look at investing in local bus lines in what we call subway deserts. Mm-hmm. So southeast Queens is, is a subway desert. And so you don't get that kind of frequent service. But that's where technology may also help us in the future because it could be on demand. That bus doesn't know that Robert's waiting on that particular corner. That bus will know, that vehicle will know exactly where the people are, are waiting. I mean, before I go to the next question, the other significant proposal that the mayor came, that the mayor has been pushing is to extend the subway down Utica Avenue, Southeast Brooklyn, is also, you know, tremendously underserved. Yeah. And he raised, you know, he was quite forceful in speaking about that, I believe, in his last State of the City speech. Is that a realistic alternative? I don't see the, you know, I don't see the kind of development that you saw at Hudson Yards that generates, you know, the additional tax revenue to pay for it. Uh, the East New York redevelopment plan works because it's the end of the number three train. I used to live out there. I grew up in the projects in East New York, the end of the new lots line. It works because there's a subway, you know, a subway line. Is the Utica Avenue extension anything beyond the pipe dream? Well, the mayor brought it up once, but unfortunately, this was almost six months ago, and he hasn't mentioned it again. This is another I think it's fascinating. I'm a, unfunded, I'm a Brooklyn guy. Right. Yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea, even if it doesn't develop Hudson Yard-style uh, office and high-end residential, because you, you want to build more uh, a housing for middle-class and working-class people. Even if you can just build a little bit more densely, you, you can build thousands of units of housing, but the mayor hasn't gone anywhere with it yet. But that does show that when it comes to the inequality issue, the Uber uh, going out to neighborhoods that cabs haven't served is good, but overall, if you are poor, you are on the train and you are on the bus, and so any transit initiative to help poor people just in sheer numbers it has to be focused on Mass the buses transit. and the trains right. maybe you take a, a car to, uh, if you have to take a relative to the doctor you know a couple times a year but almost all of the time you are going to be on the well, train and on saw, the bus. Uh, you also yeah. saw the rise of, a, of at first the informal and now lightly regulated dollar van system mm-hmm. that just arose mm-hmm. along Flatbush Avenue and parts of Southeast Queens. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paolo Coelho, and I'm from John Jay College. I wanted to know what you guys thought was the long-term and short-term solution to congestion caused by, you briefly mentioned, um, you know, taxi drivers not following basic protocol like to pull over, stuff like that. How do you impose courtesy? courtesy? I don't gotcha. know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you, re, you really need a, a serious enforcement effort. And at yeah. one time I was in charge of traffic enforcement and took no prisoners mm. and uh, removed the parking of uh, diplomats, uh, curtailed a lot of the police parking, got some of my agents were arrested. Uh, for doing that, uh, you've got to get really firm on enforcement. Let me just it's easier, and I even took a few press spaces. Let me, Bob. Uh, yes, well, that yeah. was, uh, just as a former cab driver, I will say that the, uh, uh, you know, the targeting of enforcement on cab drivers it can be very petty and can be very penny ante, yeah. and could cost somebody their license and therefore their job. And it's almost, you know, too often it's they're an easy target as opposed to the harder as opposed to the harder problems to attack. But let me say my pieces. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you an easy one, uh, uh, you know, a, a low-hanging fruit that I don't understand why the city isn't following up on. We have more people putting 
permits, bogus permits in their windshield and parking throughout Manhattan. Go to lower Manhattan, you will see entire blocks filled with these bogus permits. The trucks end up, they're in truck loading zones. The trucks are double parked, causing congestion. And they get the, the trucks tickets. are getting the tickets and they're getting towed. This is a relatively easy one. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Marcella Monet from Queens College. My question goes back to vehicle congestion. Would it be possible um, to relieve congestion through the vehicle license plate restriction? You know, well, they the had odd the and odd and even. Yeah. There were there were various proposals. They did that, you know, during the gas crisis when right. you could get gas. Right. You know, odds one day, even the next day. So people buy more cars. Right. Well, I'm not sure that that's people. what they, Mexico they, City. They, but then like, in the city, then you'd have to park. You'd have to deal with all the side the game of the for two cars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've been doing that in in Beijing and other Asian mm-hmm. cities. I think, that but that's the, because of air pollution. Yes, I think the the problem here is. With so many of the individual drivers coming into Manhattan, not frequently, but because they have a specific reason to come in that day. You know, I'm, I'm, staying, late, I'm staying out late tonight, so I want to drive home, or I've got to go get my grandmother at the airport. It'd be really hard to say you can drive to work half the week. I think it's better to do with the pricing, where... If I really need to come in, then I do pay this fee, and it may turn out that the fee has to be higher than people originally projected because of Uber pushing price down on the is. market side, right. people pushing the government pushing the price up on the you, other side. Uh, you spoken yeah. uh, eloquently on the on the degree to which the issue of inequality factors into public policy thinking on a lot of these issues. I have always been one of the reasons I was suspicious of the congestion pricing system we proposed the last time, even though my boss wound up working for somebody who was for it, so I had to be for it because I'm more loyal to my paycheck. Um, (laughs) I'm very, maybe it's the old socialist in me, I'm just suspicious of using price as a means of social control. There's just not many poor people who have a car, have insurance, and are driving to a job in Manhattan. You can find a few examples in the middle class range and so forth, and that's one thing that sort of did in the congestion pricing scheme. You find uh, someone who can basically stand in as sort of the middle class that will be punished by this, but you're right, I think that... Uh, it's, it's a fairly progressive tax in this case because the people who are driving, and they're not only paying for their car, right, but they also have the money to pay for the parking of that car, which can be very expensive. And, Bob, yeah. Bob, that's why we have the – we lower the tolls where the working class really are using those On the, on the, old, on yes. the MPA. Right. Interest Bryant. City, Queens yeah. to the Bronx or something like that. Right, if you want to visit your family members and things. Yeah. Just, uh, pardon my old bugaboos. Hi, yes. Good evening. I'm Mariana Spinoza, and I'm from Hunter College. Uh, my question speaks to the politics of the funding mechanisms in public transportation. I was wondering if you believe there was any role for civic participation, either on the federal or state level, in terms of being able to get past the political block, the polarization, and being able to fund these systems and these initiatives. One of the proposals I've heard is that we should start bonding some of these projects. That uh, That's how they built the Golden Gate Bridge. That was a publicly financed project. And as Sam mentioned earlier, a lot of states have taken the initiative of not waiting for the feds to do anything and going out on their own and raising taxes or what have you fees in order to get things done at the local level. Maybe that's what we need. Uh, the World War II, that's how we paid for World War II, how people just got w- well behind the idea of buying bonds to support the war effort, maybe, you know, we need a war on transportation. Maybe that's what we need to do. We're, uh, we're, we, I think New Yorkers have fully adopted this, mm-hmm. actually. Uh, I mm-hmm. know Nicole can speak to this as well. Uh, the MTA is, a, is an old pro, right, of uh, basically uh, issuing bonds and so forth in, in the tens of billions at this point. Of 35 death, or, billion. 35 billion. So we are carrying a lot of that. We don't know yet the financing mechanism for the Tappan Zee Bridge exactly, mm-hmm. right, right, yet. So that, there's tolls. an element there, tolls. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, one of the, I think the conversation's been a little bit limited uh, between de Blasio and uh, the governor because we really haven't had the counties involved. And I'm sort of surprised that the de Blasio administration hasn't really gone out and said, well, you know, Rob Astorino, he doesn't want to build affordable housing. Uh, but, you know, you have a lot of ha- affluent people in the county. There. Westchester County, for instance, is nothing without Metro North. 
uh, and yet you don't want to build dense housing around these stations, right? Well, maybe you'll, you, they should be asking, and maybe the de Blasio should turn the conversation around and say, maybe you should ask Westchester and Nassau County for some of this capital funding. I'm sort of surprised that wasn't, a, I mean, I'm not saying it's a, a a great strategy, but I'm sort of surprised that they haven't of used it. Of course, that. the only problem with bonding is that if, on a city level, I'm more familiar with the city budget, is the, um, the immense amount of money that we have to pay bondholders before we can hire a cop or hire a That's sanitation a, worker. Was it 7% of the MTA's budget per year? Well, it goes into? But, it's more um, than that now. It now. It's, I mean, it's, it's, like, closer, uh, it's, it's getting up to 20 and it'll be yeah, 25. Yeah, on a, on a, but yeah. even just in the city, it's like 15 or 16 cents on the dollar. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Chady Duke. I'm from John Jay College. And I want to know what's the future of the taxi medallion? Um, is it going to be uh, economically and politically? Do we have to draw a new kind of system for it? Well, I mean, that's a very, that's a very tough question. And there's a lot of people who, you know, especially, you know, immigrant drivers who, you know, come to this country. And, and it's one of the ways that you can build a nest egg and build your piece of the American dream. And that American dream is blown up in smoke on them because of the, you know, you know part of the taxi medallion system that was that was developed in the 1930s was as a protectionist system so that people who did get the medallions were able to make a lovely uh, the money without having it diffused i mean you could take the, make the same argument about labor unions they were to protect your job against people you know saying okay i'll dump you and hire somebody for half the for half the, the hourly wage so i you know i mean clearly we only have we only have forty five seconds left, but the but the owner of a, of a medallion who's bought it fairly recently is, as they say, in the uh, is underwater in terms of the value of that medallion versus what they have to be they, able to keep it up. They speculated heavily in those medallions too. I mean, there was kind of a run up as well, so that value became inflated right before Uber hit. So I, it, uh, you should save some of the tears. But that, when you say it was involved. inflated, that was that was the market in play. I mean, you know, when you say it's inflated, it's because people thought that it was a good way to make a living. So, uh, you know, it was very quickly. The city used the medallion to price a scarce resource. The resource is the streets. So you can you can complain to. I'm getting the, the I'm getting the. Uh, time to time to go, and I always try yeah. To make if they're headline. if they're not going to price that scarce resource anymore, then the value goes down. What the city does about that is not clear. Thank you all. This was a very spirited discussion. We'll see you next time on the CUNY Forum. Thank you.